Hey everyone, it's Jeannie here. Today I'm so glad to be joined by Pastor Vlad Savchuk, the leader of Hungry Generation Church. Um, he is a leading voice in the amazing ministry that we believe Jesus Christ was a part of, deliverance of course. But um, I love that you are also a pastor and you are on social media just sharing quality advice and counsel to this generation. So Pastor Vlad, thank you for joining me. Uh, Jeannie, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you. And I'm glad to uh, for this opportunity to share uh, things about freedom, deliverance, and other things. Yes. Beautiful. Uh, so I want to start there because I know of you. Um, and I think if anyone has YouTube or uh, Instagram or, you know, social media, they've probably have come across a reel or two of you just kind of teaching or preaching. But for those who don't know you, can you introduce yourself, kind of give us a brief synopsis of your journey, your spiritual journey? Uh, so uh, I grew up in the Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian by birth. At the age of 13, my family came to the United States. I'm a fourth generation of uh, Christian. My great-grandfather from my mom's side and my dad's side were not only believers, but from my mother's side, uh, they were persecuted for Christian faith and they were put in jail for 10 years, but were released on good behavior after five years, and then they were martyred. And so from my dad's side, American missionaries came and evangelized the village. My, grand my grandfather had leprosy. They prayed for him as a boy. He got healed and the whole family converted to Christ and the village was affected. And then my grandfather became a pastor of that village. He recently passed away at the age of 90 a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, so I come from, I, uh, you know, I, people always talk about generational curses. I always like to talk about generational blessings as well. I do believe yeah. that the salvation is not passed on from one generation to another, but each generation can pass on the Christian values and introduce their next generation to Jesus. And that's what happened to me. And so um, my, my family, my mom and my dad introduced that to me at a young age. At the age of 13, we came to the United States. My uncle started a church here in the States, uh, in Washington State, when I was only 13 years of age. And he really started to pour into me. And I started to preach at the age of 14. And then at the age of 16, I became a youth pastor of this church. Hungry Generation was the youth group ministry name. And then um, the youth group eventually outgrew the main church. And uh, seven years ago, I became the lead pastor. And so I've been, you know, in church and I love church. Um, even though my ministry online kind of started to take off after COVID, but I was involved with it before. Uh, but I love the local church and I love the body of Christ. And um, that's kind of a short summary of my uh, upbringing, as well as my introduction to the ministry. That's beautiful. Well, well, what an incredible legacy you follow. That's really, wow, amazing. Well, a lot of you have seen, we've heard of you or we've seen you in the film, Come Out in Jesus' Name, um, where you you and, and several ministers um, kind of join with Pastor Greg, Greg Locke to mm -hmm. kind of his discovery of deliverance ministry, acceptance of deliverance ministry and stuff like that. The film was a, a bit controversial. We covered it a bunch and, um, you know, we, we got both sides of, of the, of the coin concerning the film. Talk about your introduction to that particular ministry. I know that not every Christian church in the world or even in America uh, embrace deliverance. Uh, talk about kind of how that was something that you realized that you wanted to definitely also make sure that your ministry had. Mm -hmm. So it started with me. I have a pastor, you know, my uncle, he's still my pastor. And he's the one when I was at the young age, um, just preaching at the church and he was mentoring me. He is the one that constantly kept bringing the issue of miracles, especially the miracle of deliverance from demons to me. My pastor was a missionary to Russia for about 10 years. So he planted about nine churches there. And, you know, anytime you're on the mission field, uh, you will encounter different facets of the gospel that you don't encounter usually if you just live in a very comfortable bubble of just the Christian people. 
And so, I, you know, sometimes I call Christianity like an aquarium of exotic fish. When you're just surrounded by people who grew up in Christian homes, it's a little bit different than when you go to new territories where people come from paganism, occult, and witchcraft. And so my pastor always kind of was introducing that to me at a young age. And because we didn't see much of that in the United States, I remember when I was about 14 years of age, he would take me to Bob Larson seminars. And, uh, and yeah, that was an experience. First time I remember I, I went, I was freaked out. And so, uh, <laughs> and I was like, whoa, this, this is crazy. And my pastor's idea was that to always introduce us to the ministry of Jesus, even if it's not very well accepted, in the modern circles because he said it's not about the trends it's not about what's trending or what's cool it's about what's the gospel and plus he said a lot of what is happening in the united states american churches he said it doesn't work overseas meaning if you go to the jungles in africa if you go where the witch doctors are he's like a lot of these like you know things he's like they're not going to be super effective so him being a missionary he always wanted to introduce us the real and raw a gospel so so that's what i got exposed to the ministry of deliverance was through him what i encountered the ministry of deliverance personally is when i could not overcome addiction to pornography i was introduced to pornography at a very young age i hit it and had it secret my pastor knew about it he prayed for me and i honestly never thought that my addiction to pornography was a demonic problem because I come from a Christian family. I uh, My parents don't practice a cult. My great-grandfather didn't practice a cult. So that was the furthest thing from my mind. And when I observed deliverance, even from other ministers, I always thought that people who have demons are crazy. And I'm not crazy. So I don't have demons. You know, the fact that I had something that I couldn't overcome and the more discipline I put into it, I still battled with it even worse. That was the last thing from my mind that this could be more spiritual than flesh until I reached the end of the rope. I think it was about 15 years of age. So I was at a very young age, but I was desperately wanting to be free. And through reading a book by Jack Hayford, actually, about sexuality, he highlighted one story that the Holy Spirit used to open, to remove the scales from my eyes that I could potentially have a spiritual problem in my dealing with pornography. And so, and it's almost like my eyes were open, that there's an open door that I left open. First time I was exposed to pornography, and then the second time I was exposed to pornography. And then my, my tactic, my battle plan against this issue that I dealt with always with fasting, with prayer, renouncing. I didn't even have an internet in my home. So it's not like I had social media at the time. It was like AOL dial up. Like you have to like <laughs> wait for everybody to stop calling, uh, using the phone to use the internet. So it wasn't like that I had access to this, but it always had access to me. And so mm -hmm. when my eyes were open, I went through renouncing and I experienced self-deliverance i felt something leave me now i didn't experience those deliverances that sometimes i see happen to other people but something left me jenny and i felt that because after that point where where i was addicted and every three weeks no matter how hard i tried i would still fall into pornography now every three weeks i would still be tempted but something would be there like this self-control that i lacked to say no and walk away from it. I experienced that on my own self. And so uh, that was so liberating. And so then I started to, as I was in youth ministry, I started to teach that to other people, preach that. And I would occasionally see deliverances, not on a larger scale, until it was later on that we went to the ministry in Africa that also my pastor introduced me to that was very heavy in deliverance. And we came with a group of 12 of us from the United States. Most of them were from our youth group and we were just excited to see a different expression of Christian faith where services were like seven years, seven hours long and a lot <laughs> of deliverances happened. People get like healed like right in front of your eyes. So to us, it was like, we came from America. We're like, man, this is exciting. Part of God moving outside of the United States until half of our team start manifesting. And I was like, whoa, this is uh 
And I knew these people. Now they all had little, you know, I call them domesticated demons, meaning like one person battled with depression. The other person had snakes uh, biting her during the night. The other person watched porn every other day. But I kind of, you know, like when you know those people, you get so familiar with them. You're like, no, that, that can't be spiritual. Uh, there's an explanation for that. We have a therapist for that. We have medicine for that. We have, we have uh, disciplines for that. And so I always rationalized my team's issues. And I said that that can't be demons. It has to be an explanation for that. And there in front of me, I'm seeing a lot of them manifesting, a lot of them rolling on the floor. I'm a snake. And I was like, what? That's my, that's our team. That can't be. And um, Jenny, when we came back home, their lives were changed. That team that happened was about 10 years ago are part of our pastoral team today. Their lives are radically changed. And after that is when we started to actively engage. Because, you you know, when you experience that yourself, it's like it's almost like grace is released on your life. After that, people start just coming up to you and say, hey, I have this problem. And now you know how to deal with it better because you start praying instead of saying, Lord, give them more grace to beat this depression. You start coming against the spirit of heaviness. Not that every problem has a demon behind it, but we started to move more actively in the ministry of deliverance and next thing you know just every week people start driving from different parts of the united states flying from different parts of the world and in the last seven eight years we've been actively in the ministry of deliverance in the context and this is the interesting part of a local church hmm. yeah i'm glad you said that because that is i think um why people get tripped up because they think that it's just deliverance, that it's just, you know, you guys are be, becoming fanatical on one branch of Jesus's ministry because it's a hot button thing. It's something that makes yeah. people want to, oh, I want to go and see the deliverance minister, you know, um, and uh, just in following you on social media, it's clear that deliverance obviously is a major part of what you speak about, but it's not the only thing you speak about. And I really do appreciate that. Um, not to knock anybody who focuses mostly on deliverance, but yeah, it's because just I for think me, that Jenny, I appreciate and I will, the I will interject. I will interject that, Jenny. I think that, you know, when you discover deliverance, for some people, deliverance becomes the hammer everything is the nail, you know, mm -hmm. where it feels like it's a solution to every problem. Mm -hmm. uh, discipleship is out of the window. Disciplines are out of the window. Attending local church, therapy, uh, mental health, a lot of other things. No, not, none of that matters. All that matters is deliverance. And typically when the Lord exposes or brings a new insight to the old truth, the church typically has a tendency. We all are guilty of that to taking that to the extreme. And so we have experienced that eight years ago. So that's one of the reasons why we already, the, where we are at with deliverance, if you would have talked to me eight years ago, uh, when I just first got introduced and I saw the first healing that happened when somebody got delivered, first person who got doctor's report after leukemia, uh, the lady that had a TB, a guy that had four mental illnesses. And I mean, to me, like, that's it. That's the missing link for everything. But after a while, you begin to see, wait, no, we still need small groups. No, we still need medicine. We still need doctors. We still need uh, Sunday morning service. We still need kids ministry. We still need all of those things. And I always tell people that deliverance is not the goal. Deliverance is a means to a goal. The goal is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's why I like to use the example of the donkey. Jesus says, loose that donkey, bring the donkey to me. And then Jesus sat on the donkey and the donkey carried Jesus into Jerusalem. Every bound person needs to be delivered. Not so that they could be delivered. It's so that they could be discipled. So mm -hmm. then so they can be devoted. And so that then they could fulfill the destiny. And what is everybody's destiny? To bring Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, into every sphere that they are involved in. So deliverance is just a small part. It's important part. But I believe deliverance without discipleship will Ooh. lend us in disappointment that's incredible you you totally my next question was about discipleship because we you know i'm a pastor's wife i um just you, you don't know much about me but i grew up in the occult 
um, oh. Spanish Santeria. I grew up in that. That's what was what I was exposed to. Became a pop star, um, and that's what the Lord actually used to kind of take me out of the occult and mm -hmm. uh, suicide. I became a pop star, but that was just another idol. At, at some point, it became that, and then uh -huh. I, Jesus got a hold of me, and I became wow. His. But now I'm a pastor's wife, and um, with our ministry, we really focus heavily on discipleship, uh, of course, because mm -hmm. we believe that that's you know what we're supposed to do. But obviously, we believe also that uh, deliverance is a part of it, and it's it just all goes hand in hand. So that was my question, just about how discipleship and deliverance go hand in hand, because. What we what we've discovered is a lot of people, um, they won't even get to the point of deliverance or even maintain their deliverance without the discipleship part. Mm -hmm. And um, there's you know a big thing that went around when Come Out in Jesus' Name was released. The film, I had pastors who love and respect me that were like, I am sorry, but the fact that you are promoting this film is just wrong. We do not believe that Christians can have any type of demonic possession or demonization or any of that because they have the Holy Spirit. So that was a big thing. And I know that obviously you guys are probably sick and tired of addressing this, but I, yeah. I do think that it's important to address because legitimately there are still many people who believe that it's impossible for Christians. And my point is the reason why I'm passionate about it, I grew up in the occult. Uh -huh. And I became saved and I was saved for six years before I received deliverance. Oh, wow. So I know firsthand uh -huh. that I was a, I believed in Jesus. I was a professing follower of Christ, uh -huh. but still needed deliverance. So that's why that's my position mm. on it. I know people like you, you, you were also already in ministry when you received your yeah. deliverance. Yeah. There's some people out there that probably need deliverance and they they're just, they don't even think that this is, you know, Christians can be delivered because they don't need to. Can you talk uh -huh. to that? So I, I will, in the beginning, what you just highlighted as a, as a pastor's wife, prioritizing discipleship and integrating deliverance into discipleship. I really believe if any pastor does not bring deliverance into discipleship, um, discipleship will be short-lived because Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, and the Bible says he told people around Lazarus, loose him and let him go. Meaning you can be raised from the dead spiritually and restricted. And there are many people in our churches who are restricted in some areas of their life through trauma, through abuse, through occultic uh, practices they did before they became Christian. A lot of the demons that people are dealing with they got them beforehand. They didn't get them when they became Christians. They got them before they became Christians. And so, and if we just go with this blank statements, once you became a Christian, everything is changed. Well, there's a lot of things that didn't change. The color of your hair didn't change. The color of your skin didn't change. Your address didn't change. Uh, the, your FICO score didn't change. So we understand that everything in our spirit changed. Everything in our relationship to God changed. We're going to go to heaven instead of hell. But there are many things that begin to change through the process of sanctification, process of growth, renouncing, leaving some bad things behind, you know, uh, getting rid of sinful things. And so to to not involve aspect of deliverance in discipleship, I think it just, we rob people from the fullness of what Jesus wants to do in them. The other extreme is to have deliverance and have no discipleship. It's kind of like getting out of Egypt and ending up nowhere. After Egypt, they had to go through the promised land. Uh, they got to go through the wilderness to the promised land. I call wilderness the discipleship because that's where the stuff gets exposed. That's where God deals with disciplines. He, he, he breaks our patterns. He breaks the speech, how we speak, how our attitude and brings us into the promised land. And the promised land is the purpose, is the calling that God has for us. It's the ministry he has for us to serve in him. And so discipleship is what links the deliverance with destiny. It's it's important link. Without it, we cannot fulfill our destiny. And people who say, no, you just got saved. And after that, you just need to go straight into the ministry. That's why we have ministers who go into ministry 
and you see them struggling with homosexuality. You see them then having a public scandal. And they're like, oh, he just had a, uh, you know, sin that he fell into. But some of those people, he had sins, but some of them had real issues that needed to be resolved. But because the churches don't teach that, we rob people from that. Now, when it comes to uh, Christians having unclean spirits, there is not one verse in the Bible that clearly says that Christians cannot have demons. Now what? There are verses that are taken out of context, like oh, light and darkness cannot co uh, light and darkness cannot coexist. Well, first of all, that doesn't say that. It says that they cannot have fellowship. Fellowship and coexistence are two different things, and that verse has nothing to do with uh, demonization. It has to do with dating and marriage, because Paul says, "Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers," and by that very emphasis Paul is not telling us not to coexist with unbelievers he just says not to go into covenant with them and then he says the words righteousness and lawlessness cannot have fellowship light and darkness cannot have communion so it's not talking about coexistence it's talking about covenant God coexists with Satan he's omnipresent we coexist with unbelievers we just don't go into a covenant relationship and so it is true the demons and Holy Spirit, they don't covenant, they don't commune, meaning they don't have, they're not on the same page. But to say that if the Holy Spirit is present, demons cannot be there, well, then I would have to use that line of arguing to say that demons don't exist at all because the Holy Spirit is on earth. That means they're all gone, but that's not true. There's still evil and there's still uh, demons that are there. So people who argue that that's not possible, there is just no one verse in the scripture that indicates that that's not possible but the bible does seem to indicate for christians not to give room or place to the devil so if we are warned not to give room to the devil then my question is if we are not capable why does paul waste time to tell us to do something that's impossible even to do I had a person, Jenny, one time that um, uh, came to me and they said, I disagree with you uh, on one thing you're, uh, because you say that Christians can have demons. And he's like, that's not true. It's not in the Bible. I said, could be, maybe it's not in the Bible, but I was like, you also don't have one verse in the Bible that says Christians cannot have demons. Right. And I asked him this one question. I said, answer to me one question. Can Christians give place to the devil? He said, yes, pastor, Christians can give place to the devil. So then I, I'm like, you just pretty much crossed your own argument. If they can give place to the devil, that means that they can in some way, shape and form, give room to demons. Now, where they live, how they, how that stuff works, I don't fully comprehend that. I just know that there's a difference between a person that gets demonized and the person gets freed. When I had a mouse in my house last year, the mouse entered in not because I was a bad citizen. The mouse entered in is because I had an opening. And mm -hmm. when that mouse entered into my house, the mouse caused discomfort. It wasn't good that the mouse was in the house, but the mouse didn't become the owner of my, my house. And because I was still the owner of the house, I declared war on the mouse and by God's grace and some tools from Walmart, that mouse was <laughs> captured and that mouse was removed. So when a Christian can have a demon, this doesn't mean that the demon owns a Christian. And demons operate by few simple rules. And that is through an opening they enter. They don't care if you're Presbyterian, if you speak in tongues, they don't care if you have a Bible degree. If you get involved with the occult, it's an open door. If you stay with the habitual, unrepentant, repeated sin, that could potentially be an open door. If you harbor unforgiveness, that is a potential open door. The reason why I'm using the word potential is because just because I opened the door right now before I even came for this interview, this doesn't mean that 20 mice came into my house. So I do not want to say that if you did that, you have a demon. 
What I'm saying is that those things, if you repeatedly do them, they could potentially open doors to demonic spirits. And there's a way to check that if there's demonic spirits are there. And so not only that, we have, like what you said, we have testimonies of believers who became Christians and experienced deliverance. You can't argue with those testimonies. They're not made up. These are changed lives. We also have scriptural evidence for Jesus telling us through Paul not to give place to demons. Jesus showing up to every place in genuine. What I find interesting is Jesus' presence in this synagogue, in the public setting, didn't drive demons out only caused them to manifest. So people who say this a line of arguing, when you get Jesus in your heart, demons are automatically gone. My response to that, why that never happened in the Gospels? Why did Jesus show up in the synagogue? Demons didn't leave, they manifested. The way Jesus drove out demons is the same way he tells us to do it. He cast them out. The Bible doesn't say he came to the room and they were gone. No, the Bible says he cast them out. That means that when Jesus comes into your life, demons either go into hiding or they get provoked. They don't necessarily leave right away until they are forced out, commanded out through the ministry of deliverance. So that's kind of where the reasoning is for the ministry of deliverance. People need help who know Jesus Christ. We're not making this up by casting demons out of people, nor do we believe that every person has a demon. When people come up to me and they say, Vlad, I'm addicted to pornography, I need deliverance. I don't actually pray for them for deliverance first. I ask them first question, have you practiced discipline? Because Jesus' solution for lust is not deliverance, it's discipline. I said, have you cut off the hand and the eye? Symbolically speaking, of course, did you remove the trigger points? Have you put discipline? Are you praying and fasting? If they say no, I say, why are we going to pray for deliverance? You go and do what Jesus said. And if you do those things and the problem persists, then we can address the spiritual problem. But if you don't do the practical, we shouldn't do the spiritual. I wanted to kind of jump on what you just said about the practical thing, right? Because I think that that's where people get stuck. Um, we, you know, sometimes we encounter people that are just really consumed with fear. Maybe it's a generational thing, or maybe they just don't know how to overcome fear. Or um, there's trauma, you know, there's trauma that has just kept them in this per place of perpetual, um, I don't know, uh, like slothfulness or they just can't get yeah. on with their life they can't answer the call of God and um what are some practical things you know you talked about the practical things with pornography what are some other practical things that people can do who find themselves in prison to fear or some other kind of demonic thing of doubt or maybe I know a lot of people who have been church hurt and they just can't get over their church hurt to actually go on and answer the call. And you can see the demonic, you know, um, overtaking of that person. What mm -hmm. are some practical things? I think that there's a difference between being attacked on the outside and then being afflicted on the inside. Uh, when a person is uh, severely uh, demonized and they are afflicted on the inside, Unfortunately, they need to, um, unfortunately, the other stuff on the outside that they do, like um, cutting off the trigger points and um, uh, reading the scriptures and everything will not give them freedom. It could help them to get ready for freedom, but they need deliverance because demons need to be removed. Um, on the outside, demons need to be resisted. And so on the inside, they need to be removed. But some of the practical things that we can do when we're going through a spiritual warfare and we're not dealing with demons that are on the inside, but more of we're dealing with the demonic oppression that are coming on the outside. Um, and that is uh, one is that is repentance. It's repentance really gives us the huge, huge advantage and protects our heart from demonic intrusions because demons do want to get a foothold on the inside. The more we harbor something, um, instead of repenting for those things, for our portion of those things, what's going to happen is that the enemy will gain access uh, sooner or later. 
And then the other part is that we have to renew our mind. The Bible clearly states that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Israel came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of them. They had to go through the renewing of their mind. That's why they died like slaves, though they were no longer chased by Pharaoh. So I've seen this with people who even get delivered. Deliverance get the, gets the demons out. But renewing of the mind is what breaks the strongholds down. You can have a person who is set free, but in their mind, they're still bound. They don't have demons. They have strongholds. And strongholds are the house of thoughts. These these convincing thoughts that are developed over time. They become these subconscious convictions. They need to be broken down layer by layer. That's why Jesus says in the same setting whom the Son sets free, He says also, you shall know the truth. Meaning Jesus sets us free, but His truth also brings a certain level of freedom right here in our mind. You can live your whole life in torment without having demons, just by having strongholds. And these strongholds need to be broken down by submitting yourself to Bible study, prayer, through memorizing the verses and taking God's word like a soap and washing your mind. The other part that's also very important, and I believe that this helps to break a lot of generational curses, is to submit yourself to living in the community with other believers. Because a lot of what generational curses are is really it's stuff that gets passed on, the negative traits, negative things that get passed on from your family of origin. God has a counteractive to that by giving us His family, spiritual family. Unfortunately, what happens with many Christians is they get uh, saved, but they're homeless Christians. They're not, they're not connected to a home. And they keep declaring the breaking of the curses. I'm breaking the curses, breaking the curses. But you cannot receive those blessings, generational blessings, if you're not in a spiritual home called the church. And then, of course, they go to a spiritual home called the church, but then they get butt hurt or they get offended or the, the, the things happen and the enemy wants to take them out from the church or somebody doesn't you know, do them right because church is still mm -hmm. full of people that are not perfect. And so yeah. without having a local church that you're connected to, you can break the curses day and night, but you're not going to walk in the generational blessings if you're not in a local church. The other thing that's big personally for me, I believe, is that we have to replace what the enemy used to occupy or what he, he used to do in our life. For example, if a person was addicted to weed and they come to Christ and they're like, man, I, I don't want to be smoking weed anymore. I don't want to be a pothead. The idea is not just, Lord, take away my weed addiction. The idea is, Lord, replace that. Mm -hmm. I want to now, that time that I used to smoke weed, I want to give the time to the Lord. Many people, what they do is because they were tormented by certain sins, chains, and demons, they come to Jesus for relief, but not for replacement. They almost like, Jesus, I want you to take this away by because it took so much time, because it destroyed my relationships. It took a lot of money, Jesus. But now that you're going to give me the freedom, I can do whatever I want with my life. But that's not the purpose of Christianity. Christianity is not me coming to Jesus so I can do whatever I want. It's me actually giving my whole life now that Jesus can do what He wants. And many people get only freedom by removing bad stuff. They just don't want Jesus to occupy the place the enemy used to occupy. And now all of their life being surrendered to Jesus. So they find themselves in another prison called selfishness. Well, now they live their life for themselves instead of for Jesus. And I think it's very dangerous. So when people come for deliverance, a lot of times they ask them, are you willing to surrender your life, your whole life, not just the parts that are painful, but parts that are not to Jesus Christ? Because God doesn't just want to set us free, Jenny, from Egypt so we can run around wilderness and worship golden calves. He wants us to become His people. And some people, I feel like, like Israelites, they got out of Egypt and they were grateful that they no longer got beaten. But they didn't want to submit to God. They wanted mm -hmm. to do their own thing. And they wanted to use God as a means to a goal. And the goal is personal fulfillment, personal success. But that's not what the purpose of the cross is. Jesus is not a means to a goal. He is the goal. Deliverance is a means to that goal. And the goal is... Jesus having more of me. I like to say like this, 
Deliverance doesn't give me more of God. Deliverance gives God more of me. God mm -hmm. has more of me now that he can use and more of me that serves him, loves him, and is available to him. Mm, that is truly beautiful. And it's not popular in American Christianity, if we're being honest yeah. here. And that, I think, as pastors, as leaders, is the hardest thing. As pastors and leaders that actually feel that way, it's the hardest thing to kind of help people out of because we live in a society that is me, selfish. How can I you know, go to God because he's going to get me blessed. You know, it's, it's, it's distorted. And to be honest, I used to be a pop star. I used to have money. I used to have all these things. I would not replace any of the life that I had for the life that I have now in Christ. Mm -hmm. And what that looks like is sacrifice. What that looks like is, you know, crying with people. I'm in the trenches with people. It's not glamorous. It's not what it used mm -hmm. to be. And I wouldn't trade it for anything because of the fulfillment that I have in Christ. And I think that that's what people, we, you know, as a whole, I think as a body, what they don't understand is that when we are obedient and surrender our lives to Christ, yeah. he actually fulfills it more anyway. Yeah. I and appreciate I you. It, it's a good starting. I think, Jenny, it's a good starting line to come to come to Jesus for deliverance. But it's not where we finish. Where we finish is with discipleship. Where we finish is with self-denial. New age is all about self-discovery. Uh, new life is all about self-denial. And that's where we tr truly find his life for us. And um, we have, unfortunately, in the United States, but it's not only the United States, it's just the human nature. Right. We have traded yeah. the crucified life for the carnal life. And the results of that is that we we have just enough of the world that we don't enjoy God. And we have just enough of God that we don't enjoy the world. We're the most miserable out of all people. <laughs> so I always tell young people, I mean, even uh, older folks, and I said, listen, if you're going to experience all that Jesus has for you, you can only do that if you go 100%. And if you are going to experience all that sin has for you, you can only do that by going 100%. So I said, make up your mind. If you're going to go to hell, go all the way. If you're going to go to heaven, go all the way. But I was like, don't sit on the fence. It's most at least comfortable. And I was like, you will never experience the fullness, the beauty of Jesus when you're trying to have just enough of the world so you don't go to hell. And just enough of Jesus that you're not enjoying the world. It's just, it's a very miserable place to be in. Mm -hmm. That's what I love about you. I, I, I can, I, I feel you there. That's how I speak to people as well. It's not, you know, it's not um, cookie cutter at all. It's, it is what it is. And yeah, I, love I, gotta be about you. I love it. Is there anything um, that we can expect from you or how can we connect with you? How can people kind of link, link arms with you to get to know you more, your ministry, or follow you in some way? So we have, I have a, a website, pastorvlad.org. And on that website, I have uh, courses on deliverance, courses on deliverance, prayers, also on the ministry of deliverance, as well as on discipleship, Christian foundations, and others, um, uh, courses. And I add them every few months, new courses, they could be used for small groups and just for uh, spiritual growth. And incredible part is that those courses are completely free. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, there's those courses there. Also on Version Bible app, I think I have about 60 reading plans. Some of them on deliverance, some of them on relationship with the Holy Spirit. And on my website, uh, I also have books. I have books on deliverance. Some of it in my first book on my, kind of my journey into deliverance. It's written in a very simple, understandable um, English. Uh, packed with stories and practical examples, as well as on how to move from deliverance to dominion, uh, my book called uh, Fight Back, and as well as the recent one that's coming out uh, here in a few weeks called Host the Holy Ghost. It's how to develop personal relationship uh, with the Holy Spirit. And those books are on my website for free download, or they could be purchased through Amazon. But those are kind of main, my website is the main source. There's YouTube videos there as well, but all of the other things are on my website. Mm -hmm. And that's great because that's what I say. So many people know you from YouTube or the yeah. reels, but you see, I didn't know that you had all this content. So I'm going to be sending my people to your website as well. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Yeah. YouTube is have... like the, YouTube is like the, the front lawn. Uh, but I have other things that God has given me the grace for, and that is with school. And honestly, the school started because I was looking for small group curriculum for our church. 
And most of the small group curriculum is 40 minutes long. The video is 40 minutes. So our small groups, they cannot be eternal, you know, because people have kids. <laughs> and so yes. what we found out is like, we would download these amazing small group curricul curriculum, but it's like 50 minute long video. I was like, our people can't watch 50 minutes. That's too long. Mm -hmm. So what started to happen is I started to create it for our church. And then we made it available for online and other churches are downloading it as well. And, and, a lot of people are, you know, marketing their stuff, but I don't know. The Lord put on my heart, he said, to offer that free of charge. And even with books, same thing, because I travel overseas and we have my books translated, I think, into eight or nine different languages. Not all of the books, though. Uh, so German, Vietnamese and um, Georgian and, and the Russian and uh, Spanish and Italian, French is being translated. And so and God put on my heart three years ago, uh, Jenny, he says, I want you to offer that for free. Um, because he said the people that need it the most sometimes cannot afford it. And he's like, I'll take care of your ministry. I'll give you the people that will help you and stuff. So uh, we've been kind of offering that for people to download it free of charge. So even the book that's coming out on the Holy Spirit, uh, people the same day that the book will be available for purchase, people will be able to download it free of charge in Russian, Spanish, and English uh, on the website. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. If anybody My had pleasure. any um doubt about why you do this um i think that explains it right there i appreciate yeah people that sometimes so like much. oh you're doing this for money for and the money you know, right and I was, well because they see the youtube channel and see a lot of subscribers so everybody assumes that uh but i tell them i i don't work at the church anymore i'm a volunteer at the church i left the church staff this year a paid staff because we're building a building and the Lord put on my heart to give the salary back until we move into a new building. So I'm like, if you listen to any of my teachings, I'm like, you'll know that's not true. But I mean, uh, critics have to criticize something. So I'd rather have them <laughs> criticize something and say something that is totally not true than uh, say something that is actually true and it's bad. So yeah, it's, it's true. Thank you so much. Pastor oh, Judy, thank you so much for There's having me. It's, it's an honor and uh, I hope we'll do this again.